This is TechSnap, episode 410, for August 23rd, 2019. Hello and welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting Systems, Network, and Administration Podcast. My name is Wes and I'm joined by Jim. Welcome, Jim. What's up, everybody? Let's start this episode with some follow-up. Last month, you told us a bit about the exciting new lineup, the Ryzen 3000 series of desktop CPUs, and I, of course, was curious about the server side. At the time, you told me to wait. I'm glad that today the wait is over, and you've got some news about the epic Rome line. Yeah, uh, I'm... I got to say, I'm very excited about Rome. Uh, You know, we've kind of been speculating since the Ryzen 3000 launch, like, okay, so we know we've got a new Epic launch coming up shortly. Is that going to be the Ryzen 3000 story all over again in the data center? And, uh, you know, long story short, it it is. Um, I will say, unlike Ryzen 3000, um, Ryzen 3000 pretty much eliminated Intel's single thread performance advantage. Uh, you know, unless you go all the way up into like this just super crazy top end with an i9 9900K where Intel will get about a you know 10% advantage. Other than that, across the board, you know, in the i3, i5, i7, and Ryzen 3, Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7, you know, you're looking at a win in single thread, multi-thread, and uh, you know, thermal performance across the board. Now, in the data center with Epic, um, AMD did not erase Intel's single-threaded win with with uh, with Epic Rome. I see. Yeah, that isn't that is a big difference. Yeah. Now I will say though they didn't erase it, but uh, they cut it much much shorter. Um, you know, I, I build a lot of servers myself, and they they have usually been for the past couple of years the first generation Epic. But every once in a while, I have a client that they really need uh, you know high single-threaded performance. And for those, I don't really have a whole lot of choice but to move back to the Intel side because the single-threaded performance advantage was like 50%. Wow, yeah. Between, uh, you know, Xeon Scalable and first-generation Epic. Now, they do still have a performance advantage for single-thread, at least if you're all the way up in their gold and platinum lines. But now it's only 10 to 15%, not 50. Wow, that is a big makeup. Yeah, that's, that's a huge, huge cut down. And when you look at the fact that, I mean... We're talking now about Xeon Scalable Gold 6138 and uh, Platinum, uh, what is it, 8000 series? Uh, 8280? Uh, yeah, 8280. Um, you know, we're talking about massive parts here. You know, this performance lead, uh, you know, we're talking about scalables like the Xeon Gold 6138, which is 20 core 40 thread, or the Platinum 8280, which is 28 core 56 thread. If you're buying one of these monsters, you're not really going to be running it single threaded very often. And the thing about those single threaded performance results is they are exactly what they say on the 10. It's not per thread, it's single thread. The multi-threaded performance on, you know, a massive processor like this, it's not the single thread performance multiplied by the number of available threads. The performance per thread goes down significantly when you fully load the machine. Right. That's an important thing to keep in mind. It's it's not so nice as we like to imagine. Yeah, and so while, sure, Intel still has a 10 to 15% lead in single-threaded performance as compared, you know, to a ROM, I don't know when, if ever, you're going to be running truly single-threaded on, at the low end, a 20-core, 40-thread processor. Now, then when you look at ROM, you're talking about the bottom end is 32-core, 64-thread for the 7502. That's the cheap processor. Uh, The big boy, the 7742, is 64-core, 128-thread. Um, you just, when are you only going to be flexing one thread on one of those CPUs? Yeah, I I don't see maybe some specialized workloads, like you said, but uh, nothing I'm doing. Exactly. And, you know, when you, when you look at the actual multi-threaded workloads, the the Intel parts, they're, they're just, they're getting crushed. There's no nicer way to put it because you're not only looking at typically, you know, higher instructions per clock. Uh, you know, on each thread with a massively loaded processor, you're also talking about a whole lot more cores. You know, if you're comparing the uh, if you're comparing the 6138 to the 7502, you're going from 40 threads to 64 threads. Wow. If you're going from the Platinum 8280 up to the 7742, you're talking about going from 56 threads to 128 threads. So the the beating is immense on the massively multi-threaded workloads. 
All right. Well, then, how do things look on the cost side of things? Because that's also an important factor. The cost side is, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, it's it's pretty fantastic. The 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 Intel, the platinum, and the gold parts that we just mentioned are ten thousand dollar and twenty seven hundred dollar CPUs. Uh, the seventy seven forty two on Epic side is seven thousand dollars, so you know it's about two thirds the cost of the big boy Intel. And the Epic seventy five hundred two is twenty six hundred, which is you know it's it's a hair under the uh, the gold sixty one thirty eight. But really, what you probably ought to be looking at there is cost per CPU thread. That's where it really gets interesting to me. Now, the lowest cost per thread, unsurprisingly, is that 32 core Epic 7502, which comes in at, you know, about $40 a thread. This is what really gets interesting to me. The cost per thread doesn't go up much on the Epic side from the uh, from the smaller one to the enormous one. Mm, yeah, you step it up. Yeah, you only go from $40 a thread to $54 a thread. Hey, I like these numbers. Now, the contrast here on the Intel side, and this is what we've mostly been used to, you know, when you start thinking about scaling a workload, you got to make some really hard decisions whether to scale up or scale out that have to do with, you know, cost efficiency as much as they do with how well it works for your workload. Because going from 20 cores to 28 cores on the Intel side takes you from 6750 a thread to $178 a thread. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, no matter what, you're you're actually spending less per thread even on the big Epic versus the smaller Intel. And you just you never have to leap off that price cliff that makes you say, OK, yeah, I can get a bigger processor than this. But we're, you know, we're up in just complete cloud cuckoo, you know, prices, literally no object land. Do we want to do that? You never really have to make that decision with the Epic. You just kind of put the slider where you want it. All right. Well, what about power consumption? The, you know, the short version, Wes, is the power consumption is good on Epic, just like it was on uh, Ryzen 3000. AMD is not making, you know, any toaster oven CPUs anymore. Um, but it, it does get a little bit more complex because particularly, you know, when you look at the big Epic 7742, you know, that thing's a monster. It's a ton of threads. It's a ton of performance. Now, that processor, it, it does consume a little bit more power, at least at baseline, than the 8280. But there's so much more performance, it more than makes up for it. There's also the fact that, you know, you can compare TDP between an AMD and an Intel part. And it really doesn't tell you the whole story because the two companies don't really measure the TDP the same. As far as Intel is concerned, the TDP is what the CPU uh, consumes when it's, you know, fully loaded at the base clock. Whereas my understanding with Intel is that, you know, even when you're all the way up on the boost clock, you're not going to exceed what they said, you know, the max TDP was. So you see this like if you're building a gaming rig, for example, you know, with, uh, you know, one of the Intel K processors that you can basically just tell it to run at the boost clock all the time. You can, but you better have a hell of a lot more cooling than the TDP would otherwise indicate if you're going to do it. If you don't, then it just thermally regulates itself and you wasted your money on the K. Right. Michael Larable over at Pharonix, he did a uh, he did an analysis on the performance that I really appreciated. He loaded up all of the CPUs uh, with OpenSSL, and uh, he he measured the power along with you know the uh, the number of signs per second done with the OpenSSL library, and so that gives you a a really a pretty good real world idea because you can look at the OpenSSL performance gotten per watt that you consume. Right. And of course, in that case, you know, more is going to be better because you're talking about signs per second per watt. Yeah. And the uh, the double platinum 8280 managed uh, 40 signs per second per watt. The double 7742 on the AMD side managed 60 per second per watt. Wow. Okay. So, you know, for an actually heavily loaded processor, which is presumably the only reason you're buying one of these damn things to begin with, um, you know, you've got half, again, the actual thermal efficiency in terms of work done per watt of power consumed on AMD's side. Wow, that sounds like a clear win. I was also interested to see some new developments in encrypted memory. Now, I'm a little bit familiar with Intel's SGX, but it seems like AMD's up to a whole lot more here. Yeah, they really are. Uh, and I, I don't think these, these features are getting anywhere near enough press. Um, so basically, you know, we've all heard of Intel's management engine. Uh, AMD has its own equivalent to that called the AMD Secure Processor. 
Um, on AMD side, that boils down to an on-die ARM A5 CPU that runs outside the x86 context, meaning you can't access it either read or write, you know, from the perspective of somebody who's got root on the x86 hardware. Right. And you know that that of course can it can present some some kind of scary possibilities of this like you know ring zero or you know would you even call it ring negative one compromise that you know you can't do anything about the system that always has control and you have no control exactly but it makes some really interesting things possible and I will say uh, you know AMD's record has not been perfect security wise with the SCP but it has been significantly less gnarly than uh, than Intel's management engine, we'll say that. But anyway, what you can do with the SEP and would not be able to do without it is this really awesome fe feature called secure memory encryption. Now, SME has actually been around since the first generation Epic, um, but you know, I'm embarrassed to say I had never heard of it until the Rome launch. Same here. So the way secure memory encryption works is you've got a hardware AES-128 engine inside the memory controller on Epic. And the keys to that engine are managed by the secure processor, not by the x86 layer. Ah, so even if you have, you know, there's some something malicious controlling the x86, well, it's, it's separate. So if secure memory encryption is enabled in the system BIOS, then every single byte of RAM in the system is going to be encrypted with a key that's provided by the secure processor and decrypted when it's properly requested by the CPU. Now, what that does not protect you against is if you run rogue code that uh, the code actually accesses memory that it's not supposed to be able to in the ways that you would normally access memory. If you make a mistake in your programming, uh, SME is not going to save you from that. What SME does mitigate is attacks like Rowhammer and Rambleed. Now, those are physics-based attacks that revolve around the idea that by directly manipu manipulating memory that you do have access to, that's you know physically on die close to memory that you don't have access to, you can either change the values in that adjacent RAM by flashing from O's to ones and back again really, really fast and trying to, you know, influence it just through direct physics. Right. Taking advantage of some of the properties inherent to how modern RAM works. So that's what Rowhammer does. What Rambleed does is basically the same thing, except it infers the values that are in those adjacent areas of memory by some of the same techniques, by trying to figure out, you know, what's happening inside the RAM that it has access to. Right, so corruption versus like actual information leakage. Yeah, but either way, these are physics-based attacks. And if you do that on a machine that's got secure memory encryption enabled, then what you end up with is you end up with the encrypted value of that memory that you don't have access to because your attack was at the physics level, not at the actual you know CPU level, not at the logic level. So you get, you know, you, you may, maybe you still can get that data by use of RAM bleed, but you got it encrypted in AES-128 with a key that you have no access to. Might this also protect against uh, cold boot style attacks where you try to read RAM after a machine's been shut down with physical access? Oh, uh, yeah, it absolutely would. Um, it, yeah, if you have some way of, uh, and it doesn't really matter if it's cold or not, if you, you're still basically talking about what boils down to, you know, a physics level attack. You're trying to get the raw hardware zeros and ones in ways that the actual system doesn't want you to have them. And so if you manage to do that in any way with SME enabled, yeah, you may still get it, but now it's going to be encrypted AES-128 with a key you have no access to. Um, similarly, uh, you know, if you do a row hammer attack, now SME won't stop you from using row hammer to alter values of RAM that you don't, you're not supposed to have access to. However, uh, it's still a big mitigation because now you have the potential to maybe be able to, uh, you know, cause a denial of service. Maybe you can make a service crash, but you can't do anything predictable. You can't actually inject code somewhere you want to inject it to get, you know, something meaningful executed. So it's a pretty big deal. Right. Yeah. You may, you may hurt a service, but you can't really compromise it. Yeah, because you, you just you don't know the value of the data that you're injecting. You're effectively just injecting random trash. You can't inject code. All right, Jim. Well, now that you've explained SME, how does this actually compare to Intel's software card? So SGX does some of the same things that SME does, but the, the big difference here is that SGX is only applicable for a very small amount of RAM. There is a significant performance penalty to using it. 
And the software that wants to use SGX encrypted RAM has to be specifically written to access it. It's a pretty major code base overhaul. So you can't just turn SGX on for some workload you want to run. It has to be designed for it from the get-go and you pay a performance penalty for using it. There is no performance penalty with SME and it applies to every last byte of RAM on the whole system. Rather than having to use this special API to go stash some especially important secrets in this privileged area of memory. That's a stark contrast. Yeah, everything's a privileged area of memory and there's no penalty and you don't have to write any special software. You literally just have to turn it on in BIOS. That's great. So moving on from secure memory encryption, you can take that a step further. There's an a even cooler feature called secure encrypted virtualization. Now this builds on the SME concept, but with SEV, rather than just having a single key that encrypts all of your memory, VMs or containers can actually have their own key for their portion of RAM. Oh. Now what this means is container breakouts and virtual machine breakouts become much more difficult because, you know, again, a container or VM breakout attack is going to be a lot like the logic attacks that we talked about earlier. They kind of happen outside the expected context of the processor. So what's going to happen is when you've got code that is running within the context of a container or a virtual machine and it starts trying to access uh, areas of RAM that belong to either another container or VM or even to the host system itself, it's got the wrong key. So even if it can actually manage to break out and get access to that other uh, you know, area of RAM, uh, it can't really do anything useful with it again because it's encrypted with a key that it doesn't have and it can't have access to. Now, this brings us back to why you have to have this, the AMD secure processor to make this work, because that's the piece that actually, you know, handles which key gets used for what piece of RAM, and it has to be completely inaccessible to the x86 layer. That's what allows you to actually insulate one from the other. Now, uh, you know, much like SME, secure encrypted virtualization actually was available with first generation Epic, although, again, I personally wasn't aware of it, and I don't know anybody that had been using it, but... With first generation Epic, SEV only supported up to 15 separate keys. So you could have your host and you could have 14 VMs or containers, and that was about all you could manage that with. Ah, uh, okay. So work for some things, but not massive scale. Right. But Rome extends the support to 509 individual keys at once. Nice. Rome also adds a new feature, uh, Secure Encrypted Virtualization Encrypted State, SEV-ES. Now, with this new version of Secure Encrypted Virtualization, in addition to the RAM, a VM's entire CPU state can also be encrypted. So contents of the hardware registers, all that good stuff. And again, those keys are inaccessible either to other guests or to the host. Now, I had some really interesting feedback from a reader on Ars Technica that was upset about this. Like, I, I don't like that. You know, why don't I have access to this? I'm the sysadmin. I should have root on everything, right? Well, the answer there is, you know, that's that's fine if that's your choice. Well, you can just disable it and not use that feature. But if you want to run, you know, one of these big ROM machines, maybe, you know, a, a dual 8280 with uh, 256 threads on a single machine at a data center, and you're spinning up containers or VMs, and you're not using those directly, you're leasing those out to other people, a la, you know, AWS or Linode or DigitalOcean, with SEVES, you can do that and you can actually offer your customers assurance that even though they're running on your hardware, you have no access to their data. So now that makes it possible for people that have really confidential workloads to set up their VM running off of an at-risk encrypted file system using SEVES for the system state and the RAM, and you're allowing them the use of your hardware, but they don't have to worry about you having root on their data. Right. It really feels like it's making, you know, this wonderful concept of virtualization, this ability to multiplex and use computers as, as more than one thing. It's just taking it to the logical next level. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the first thing, of course, you know, when I saw SEV is I'm thinking, oh, well, good, you know, I'll be safe from the VMs. But it's just it's really interesting when you look at the the larger picture and where a lot of these really big boxes are go are, are going to go. You know, it, it makes the VMs safe from the host, too. That's pretty cool. You know, that can enable some pretty big cost savings from anybody who's at least from anybody who's willing to trust that AES 128 encryption because they do know that the host isn't going to have access to the keys to that and that can mean the difference between you know renting entire lockable racks that you know physically 
are isolated from the data center employees that they don't have keys to, even when you don't necessarily need that much compute power to now being able to say, no, you know, we can actually run our workload on the cloud now. Well, we can't ignore the other big player in this space who's also had some recent news. Yes, of course, it's Intel. Yeah, you know, there, uh, there really hasn't been any news on the Xeon side for Intel yet. Um, now, recently on the mobile side, you know, that's that's the uh, that's the one shoe that hasn't dropped yet. And of course, I just made AMD have three feet. But anyway, that's the one shoe that hasn't dropped yet for AMD. They haven't released their seven nanometer mobile parts yet. Right. Still waiting there. Yep. Whereas Intel has kind of gone mobile first. They released their Ice Lake line, which is 10 nanometer down from 14 nanometer. It's a 10 nanometer process. But they've only released the laptop parts so far. That's Ice Lake. And the Ice Lake parts were, uh, they were pretty cool. Um, they weren't necessarily faster than Whiskey Lake, you know, just in raw performance terms. Mm, right. But they were a lot more efficient, much more performance per watt. And the other thing that was really, really cool, I got very excited about Ice Lake. Intel shifted from their old UHD onboard graphics to a new chipset uh, called Iris Plus. Oh, boy. Iris Plus is a gigantic leap above UHD. So, you know, the UHD graphics were great as far as they went. Uh, if all you really had was just kind of a generic desktop, you know, workstation -y load, and you didn't need to do any gaming, much less, you know, any 3D design. Sure. Uh, Intel UHD graphics were, were just fine. But the minute you started to do something, you know, serious, maybe you wanted to do, uh, you know, GPU-based rendering for something at work, or you want to start playing some serious games, UHD falls flat on its, on its face. And, you know, then you're having to look at a discrete, you know, NVIDIA GPU in your laptop to uh, to take up the workload. And that means it means a lot more heat generated. It means a lot shorter battery life. Uh, I actually have to this day, um, I have an ouchy place on the base of my left hand because I spent a year or two ignoring, you know, the heat coming from the GPU and an Intel slash NVIDIA powered laptop because, you know, it wasn't hot enough to like, well, okay, well, it's not like burning me, burning me. It's just uncomfortable. Just slowly cooking you. Exactly. I ignored that and slowly cooked the palm of my left hand for about a year before I realized my hand hurt all the time now, like not just when it was on the laptop. Yeah, there's a real, yeah, there's a real risk there. And power savings in, in this domain matters. Yeah, it really does. Well, anyway, so Iris Plus, uh, you know, it, it's not... It's not as high performance as the highest end, you know, NVIDIA discrete GPU parts for the laptop. Of course, right. But it's right there with like the low to mid end. You can actually do 1440p gaming pretty credibly on a uh, you know, like an 8 watt <laughs> Ice Lake processor. So this is really something to get excited about. That's lovely. But, uh, you know, the embargo on this will have lifted on the 21st. Um, Intel is really confusing the lineup a lot because they they dropped this Ice Lake series that's, you know, i3, i5, and i7, and several variants, both high power consumption and lower power consumption. You thought, well, that's the whole line. That's what Intel's doing in Q3 for laptops. Well, no, it's not. Because Intel has also released a Comet Lake line also for the laptop, i3, i5, and i7 in both high power consumption and lower power consumption model lines, and uh, that's on the 14 nanometer process, not the 10 nanometer. Wait, 14 still? 14 still. And the really frustrating thing is, uh, you know, when I talked to Intel's folks that were presenting this last week, they really didn't want to make a differentiator between Ice Lake and Comet Lake. Uh, they didn't want to position one as the, you know, lower, lower cost, but lower performance. They didn't want to uh, position one is, you know, higher cost, but you get either lower power consumption or higher performance or whatever. They're just like, oh, it's all great. Everything's wonderful. These are all great CPUs and we don't want to push one above the other. That's going to confuse the crap out of consumers. And uh, I think a lot of consumers are going to be really disappointed when they get a part that doesn't match the expectations that they had from press coverage. Because, um, you know, if you get a comment like, laptop CPU that drops in Q3, it's not going to have those Iris Plus graphics. It's going to have the old UHD. Right. And I just, I don't see how consumers are going to be able to make heads or tails out of this product line. It's already difficult, right? You're looking up processor details. Absolutely. Who does that? When you when you think you've got the latest CPU from Intel, you'd, you'd expect all the fancy stuff you hear about. 
Yeah, you know, most people are going to think, oh, well, you know, I'm getting a, I get an i3 or an i5 or an i7, and I know basically what that means. Well, now not only do you not know what that means, because there are higher power consumption and lower power consumption variants of those. Uh, there's also Ice Lake high power, Ice Lake low power, Comet Lake high power, and Comet Lake low power. And they have different GPUs attached and just, it's a mess. We're going to need like a whole big spreadsheet that's sortable. And I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm already confused. Meanwhile, you know, we don't know what AMD is going to do yet. Uh, they have not released any details, but um, we know typically AMD puts out, you know, like a third to a half as many SKUs as Intel does to cover the same, same range. And their next release is going to be seven nanometer and it should have, you know, a GPU inspired by their recent uh, you know, desktop GPU Navi release. So uh, the ball is very much in AMD's court. Well, it's been a busy few weeks for Windows security researchers and administrators with not one, not two, but three separate vulnerabilities being out there. Let's start with the one you noticed. And that's CTF tool, which uses and abuses Microsoft's text services framework. That's a framework I didn't even know existed. I can see you don't uh, you don't speak many foreign languages then, Wes. Unfortunately, no, just nerd speak. Yeah, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Windows text services framework, um, that's the framework that underlies the ability to type in uh, foreign languages that have a lot more characters in them than, uh, than English does. Um, if you type in Chinese or in Japanese, you got to do pinyin or you got to do romaji. Basically, the way this works is because either of those languages, you know, has hundreds to thousands of individual characters that you might need to reference in the course of just typing a, a short email. Ah, yeah. The way that Chinese and Japanese folks do this, and there are other languages that that use the uh, the text services framework as well, but I'll just look mostly at Chinese and Japanese because those are the ones that I'm familiar with. The way this works is you actually type using the Roman alphabet, uh, you know, phonetically to spell out what you're trying to say. Ah, just like on a, on a regular keyboard. On a regular keyboard, on just a regular U.S. keyboard. Uh, like, you know, in Japanese, if you wanted to, if you wanted to type out, you know, um, if you want to type out the words, I, you know, watakushi, then as you're typing, you type in W a and tech services framework is going to drop down options for you to convert that W a into either a, um, katakana or, oh God, it's been a while since college. Um, uh, hiragana, hiragana. Thank you. Katakana or hiragana character for wa. Um, you probably won't actually pick either of those. You'll probably keep out typing, keep on typing until you get, you know, Watashi all the way on out. And when you do, now you'll have the option either to do katakana or hiragana symbols for all those characters, or you'll get to do the um, the kanji, which is one single character for the whole word. And basically, you can access all this by keyboard shortcuts. When you decide you want to do one of these things, you type in a couple of keys to select one of these sub options, and it magically converts it. Um, that sounds like a horrible Rube Goldberg, but it turns out that is actually the best way to type in a language that has hundreds or thousands of characters. So that's the way it's done. And in order to make that magic happen, you have to be able to do that in literally any application on the entire system, any system dialogue, you have to have this underlying framework that can capture this stuff. Right. That's why it's at the OS level here. Exactly. Capture all this keyboard input and offer options and send messages to, you know, the windows that are running these actual applications. That's what the tech services framework does. Now, what happened is, uh, you know, Google's Project Zero researcher, uh, Tavis Ormandy, he starts digging around and he's not actually thinking, let me poke at the tech services framework and see if anything's broken in that. He just gets hold of a list that's basically, it's a white list of all the messages that an unprivileged window should be allowed to send to a privileged window. And he thinks, okay, well, let's just validate that I can't send any messages to a privileged window from an unprivileged window that are not on this white list. That'll be pretty easy to check. I'll code up this little C program that sends all possible messages and I'll compare the results of the ones that work to this whitelist. It'll match and that will, 
assure me that I understand what I'm looking at and I can move on with my day and find something useful. That makes sense. Much to his surprise, when he sent all possible messages to a, a, a notepad instance running as administrator, uh, several of them went through that did not belong to that whitelist. So that's when he starts digging, and what he ultimately discovers is um, the CTF process, which uh, turns out to be a common text framework, um, but it might as well be capture the flag, because this thing dates all the way back to the Windows 98 days. Um, CTF graybeards like me you may remember back in the xp days you would always when you you know open up task manager and you start looking for weird processes because you think this user's got some malware or some spyware or whatever you see something called ctfmon.exe and you're like what the hell is that and you go google it and you find out oh that's part of microsoft Word. okay never mind move on to the next thing but it's just it's one of those kind of weird names that maybe not for everybody but for me i googled it five or six times because every time i saw it it would make me a little uncomfortable well, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the CTF framework. Uh, used to be ctfmon.exe back then. Uh, now it doesn't show up quite so cleanly. Like I said, this dates all the way back to pre-XP. Yikes. The CTF framework goes back to Microsoft Office XP, which was available for Windows 98. Wow, that is ancient. It is ancient. And it is coded the way that you would expect a Windows 98 application to be coded. Uh-oh. Do you remember logging into Windows 98 machines? Yeah. Do you remember what happened when you're faced with that initial Windows 98 login prompt with the username and password if you just hit escape? No, you know, that I don't remember. Yeah, it just closed. You're at the desktop. What? No. Yeah, done. That, that can't be right. That is right. Uh, because, you know, it uh, Windows 98 really only used that username and password for network authentication stuff. It would cache it for, you know, SMB stuff. Uh, right. A lot of people didn't realize that. They thought, oh, well, you know, nobody can log into my computer without my password, not realizing that I mean, you can literally just close the freaking prompt and you're right there at the desktop. You're done. You know, this is the era that the CTF framework comes from. And, you know, much like 98, where you could just hit escape if you didn't want to bother typing in that pesky password, there's no access control in CTF. Um, you can connect with it any process to the CTF framework and from there to any other process, it'll escape sandboxes, anything. There's no access control. You do have to report your thread ID, your process ID and your window handle, but the client just tells the CTF framework what they are. Oh, right. You just, so you, you're, you just have to be honest. Yeah. Th this is my thread ID. This is my PID. This is my window handle. Just believe that. And CTF just believes it. There's no verification. So you can just lie. You can just tell it you are whoever you want to be. It gets even worse because CTF allows the client to call any function pointer in the program it's referencing. Oh, really? And it catches exceptions. No. Yeah. So if you're trying to map out all the function pointers available in a, you know, a CTF client that you're, you're connecting to. Right. You can just keep trying stuff. And if it would crash, CTF catches it keeps it from crashing and tells you, oh, that crashed. And here's some handy diagnostic data about this. It just helps you along. Even ASLR, address space layout randomization, doesn't help much with this. So ASLR basically makes it so that a program will never load into memory the same way twice. You know, different chunks of it will be loaded into a different part of memory space in a way that's randomized when you initially load the application. Right. Try to prevent stuff like this. Yeah, but that doesn't help either, because even if you got ASLR turned on, the CTF marshalling protocol actually tells you where the monitor stack is located when you connect to it. Wow. This is a beautiful find. Good work from Project Zero. Yeah, it really was. It really was. Um, so I, I downloaded uh, I downloaded Tavis's tool, and I played with it on a uh, Windows 10 1903 box that had not had that morning's Patch Tuesday you know, applied yet. You know, sure enough, it did exactly what it says. Um, you run the tool and you just wait a few seconds and the tool itself will spawn, uh, you know, a UAC dialogue from doing a, a run as. And you just stare at the dialogue. Don't type anything. It takes a few seconds because a CTF tool, you know, it, it needs to map out the uh, the function space. It bashes against a bunch of the, the function pointers for a while to find the right one. Exactly. So there's a little trial and error, but you don't really see all that. All you have to do is just keep your... Keep your mitts off the keyboard for about four or five seconds. Then the UAC prompt goes away and you've got a CMD prompt that's running as local system. Oh boy, that is great. 
game over. And that vulnerability was in the stack for 20 years. Well, it's good to see it finally closed, but it just goes to show, you know, Windows has a lot of those legacy compatibility things still lurking around. And it can be great for people that, you know, are able to update to modern Windows and still run some of their ancient applications. But it's also a security quagmire. Well, you know, the other thing about that, Wes, is, you know, this this is... This should be a wake-up call to all y'all out there that don't want to go to Windows 10 and you're just hanging on to your Windows 7 desktops or your, you know, Server 2003, you know, whatever, and you don't want to upgrade. You need to because you got lucky on this one. Uh, if Tavis had found this four months later, and keep in mind, you know, four months is not a long time when you're talking about a vulnerability that lurked in the stack for 20 years. Right. If he had found this four months later, you wouldn't be getting a patch. You would just have to live with this. So, uh, yeah, you, you need to update. You need to get on Windows 10. Even if you don't like it, I'm sorry. You just don't have any choice. Unless, you know, you, you just want to say goodbye to the whole Windows ecosystem entirely and, uh, you know, install Ubuntu. Yeah, and if you do, well, hey, maybe you check out Choose Linux, Choose Linux show, a Jupiter Broadcasting show that's all about the excitement of discovering Linux. Now, just to hammer that point home a little bit more, this round of Patch Tuesday also saw two new, yeah, not not old, not blue, keep something else, two new wormable vulnerabilities in RDP. Yeah, because, you know, that blue keep stuff, I mean, that's just so old. That's like, you know, a few weeks. That's forever, right? <laughs> yeah, but much like blue keep, we're talking about, you know, remote code execution vulnerabilities in remote desktop services again. Uh, there's two of them. They can be turned into into worms, meaning you can write a program that, you know, port scans the Internet looking for available RDP sessions and connects to them and infects that machine, which then in turn looks for more machines to infect. Um, those were also patched in that Patch Tuesday, which is my second love letter to you Windows users out there. Don't expose RDP to the Internet. It's not safe. It will never be safe. A little bit of good news is that these vulnerabilities were discovered by Microsoft during some of its own hardening efforts. And this isn't a problem in RDP itself. It's just a problem in all the affected versions, which include Windows 7, 2008 R2, Server 2012, 8.1, and Windows 10. So, yeah, go get your updates, everyone. Yeah, and, you know, we, we should be clear what we mean when we say it's not a problem in a remote desktop protocol itself. That means that the protocol itself didn't have the security flaw. It was the particular implementation, which was used in all versions of Windows. But that is a re reasonable distinction to be made, because when you've got a flaw in a protocol, you have to change the entire protocol in ways that usually break programs from being able to access each other. Whereas when you just have a bug in an implementation, you can just fix the implementation and move on with your day. Now, for an example of something that actually is a bug in the protocol itself, we've got the new knob attack on Bluetooth. Yeah, unfortunately, the specification of Bluetooth includes an encryption key negotiation protocol that allows to negotiate encryption keys with one byte of entropy without protecting the integrity of that negotiation process. So a remote attacker can manipulate the entropy negotiation to let any standards compliant Bluetooth device negotiate encryption keys with one byte of entropy and then brute force that easy to guess key. Yikes. Yeah, one byte passwords don't tend to uh, take too long to brute force. Now, the, the good news about this is, well, there's a little bit more bad news first. The bad news is that this entire key exchange session that, uh, you know, can be attacked this way, it is all completely in the clear. Yikes, right? It is just wide open, no encryption, uh, no nothing. Just here's here's two dudes exchanging some keys. Uh, anybody else got any input on this? Now, the good news here is that it's actually very difficult to exploit in the wild because while this key exchange does happen out in the open and there's no way for uh, in, you know, in cryptographic terms, we would call the two devices trying to exchange keys, Alice and Bob, and we call the third party Charlie. Of course. So the good news here is that it's actually very difficult for Charlie because although Alice and Bob are basically just yelling their entire key exchange session out into the open, Alice has no idea whether she's talking to Bob or whether she's talking to Charlie at any given time. The good news is that in order to actually exploit this, Charlie basically has to actually intercept Alice's attempt to communicate with Bob, jam it so that Bob 
doesn't hear it, then inject Charlie's own version of it to Bob, and then do the same thing again, intercepting Bob's attempt to communicate with Alice, jam it, and yet let Alice hear his version of what Bob had to say. So pulling all this off requires some pretty nasty timing. Um, you know, simultaneously receiving, understanding, and jamming signals in the real world tends to be pretty difficult. Yeah, that sounds like a complicated setup to pull something like this off. But as you say, you know, this is a problem in the protocol. So probably better safe than sorry. Yeah, no, there, there have been some mitigations. Uh, basically, you know, just change the firmware to completely get out of standard with the protocol and just say, no, I will not. <laughs> I, I, I do not agree to negotiate a one byte key for this session. Um, I should also mention that, you know, while it would be pretty difficult for Charlie to get in the middle of Alice and Bob when it's, you know, literally like somebody sitting in their car trying to connect to their Bluetooth with their phone right there in the car, one way that you could much more easily pull this off is instead, you know that Alice is the phone in this user's pocket and Bob is that user's car over there in the garage. Now you put Charlie in the middle where Alice isn't actually in range of Bob or vice versa, but they're both in range of Charlie. Ah. And so now at this point, uh, Charlie is able to receive the communications from either of them and proxy them on, but proxy them changed. All right, a little evil repeater in the middle. Exactly. Now, so, you know, what you would do there is it, obviously, it, you know, you need to be in a position that you truly can be in the middle before those devices are actually in range. But that's going to be a lot easier to pull off than, you know, trying somehow to jam a signal so that the, the signal that already went out, you have to get Alice not to pay attention to it. That's going to be pretty tough. And the one other thing I want to say about this is that uh, I see an awful lot of people saying, well, I don't really care about this. You know, if somebody wants to listen in to uh, my music streaming in my car, I don't care. Or, you know, a, a lot of the other, you know, audio related things that folks are doing with Bluetooth. But keep in mind, there's an awful lot of Bluetooth keyboards out there. And if you don't think that the communication between your keyboard and your computer should be secure, I, I don't know what to tell you. And, you know, it, it's just kind of another example of a, an older protocol. And these days, we know we should expect better and design security in from the beginning. Before we get out of here today, let's talk about two stories that I noticed that just might make some big changes in the SSL certificate marketplace. Uh, the one that really jumps out at everybody, Wes, I'm sure is uh, Troy Hunt declaring that extended validation certificates are really, really dead. There'd been a bit of a death watch already, right, Jim? So for those of you who aren't familiar, extended validation certificates are something that very few people ever really bothered with. Uh, the concept is that instead of a domain validated certificate, which the, the SSL certificate vendor for domain validation certificate, they just basically make sure you have control of that domain by technical means. If you say, I want a uh, certificate right. for jupiterbroadcasting.com, well, then they're going to say, okay, you need to put a text record in the DNS for jupiterbroadcasting.com that we tell you to. That way, we know you're really in control of that domain. Or if you don't want to do that, then maybe we'll give you a text file, you know, full of garbage that you can put in the web root of your site, and we can check to make sure that's there. So we know this certificate that we're giving to you really is from somebody who controls that site, that domain. Extended validation certificates, they cost a lot more money. And the way that they're supposed to work, at least, is you have to provide some kind of like real world, you know, outside the internet, outside the computer space indication that you really are who you're saying you are. So if you want an extended validation certificate for IBM.com, it's not good enough to make a change to the website IBM.com or make a change to their DNS. You're going to need to actually produce documents that say, okay, like, you know, here is corporate paperwork, you know, for IBM, the corporation, you know, here is my employment, here's an address, here's, you know, me on the company site. Basically, a real human is supposed to do some real legwork to, you know, really come up with this idea that we are certain that this person that we gave the certificate to is supposed to have it. Right. That's where the extra, the extended security and validation comes from. Now, buying that EV certificate, when they first introduced these things, it didn't really get you anything unless somebody went to the trouble of actually looking up your certificate information and seeing whether it was EV or DV. And basically, nobody actually did that. Um, 
After a little while of that, major browser vendors, they started flirting with the green lock in the address bar to show that you were on an HTTPS site. And you know, then they would have it to where, in addition to the green lock, if you had an extended validation certificate, there would be the name of the entity all in green before the actual URI. So in addition to the green lock, if you went to HTTPS www.ibm.com, in green text before the actual URI, you might see something to the effect of IBM Corporation. And uh, it's a mess. If the browser doesn't give you that uh, that green organization name before the URI, you actually have to do a table lookup to figure out whether a certificate is extended validation or not, um, which really just helps put the final nail in the coffin of EV certificates. You can still buy one, but nobody is going to know whether you did or not. Now, to make matters even worse for paid certificate vendors... Google wants to reduce the lifespan for HTTPS certificates down to one year. Yep. Uh, you know, the Let's Encrypt has really done some some van damage to the old uh, sell certificate business in recent years anyway, because, of course, it doesn't cost you anything and uh, it's pretty easy to implement. And yes, personally, as a sysadmin, the biggest advantage I've found from Let's Encrypt, you know, it's not that it saves me seven or eight bucks a year you know, on the cost of operating a website, I really don't care that much about that. But the fact that I can just set it up and it will just work and keep working and automatically renew certificates in the background and I don't have to constantly keep messing with it, that is well worth the price of entrance. Right. Now that Google's saying that, you know, they want browsers to just stop trusting certs that are more than a year old, regardless of when their expiration date is baked into the certificate. Man, that just removes the last advantage for going out and buying a certificate from a vendor rather than just doing Let's Encrypt for free. Now, of course, the vendors are pushing back and this decision isn't final. They really question the security benefits that would be gained here. Google sees it differently, though, and, you know, suggests that the real problem is that bad SSL certificates, well, they're they're never getting revoked. So the best we can hope for is to constrain that damage by constraining their lifespan. Yeah, you know, the, the problem that Google's referring to there is uh, when you revoke an SSL certificate that's been compromised, you know, somebody's got a copy of that key that they shouldn't, or the certificate was generated in error uh, or by a rogue certificate authority, you're supposed to be able to revoke that cert so that everybody's browser will know this is not a good certificate any longer. But the problem is for that to work, the browser actually has to know about where a list of all the revoked certificates can be found so that it can compare the certificate that it's been handed with this list of revoked ones and, you know, say, oh, OK, well, I shouldn't trust this one after all. And in practice, that just doesn't work very well. So you end up with this giant laundry list of uh, compromised or incorrectly generated uh, you know, or just plain bad certificates out there that bad actors can get their hands on and use. And if that certificate is valid for five years or 10 years, that tremendously extends the lifespan of, you know, that potential exploit. It makes me think that, you know, it kind of speaks to, to many of the updated practices in our industry, where once you might set something up and never touch it again, these days, you know, the modern approach is repeatability and automation. And it's exactly the same when you're comparing these, you know, this legacy model of buying a 10-year certificate to using Let's Encrypt. Yeah, and you know, I I think we truly do kind of have to examine the motivations here. Um, Digicert, of course, has a huge financial motivation in, you know, saying, no, don't drop the lifespan on this. Because like we said, you know, once you no longer have the advantage of saying, well, you know, I'd rather just go ahead and buy a five-year cert and they don't have to touch it for five years and that's easier. Once you take that away and you say, no, if you're going to buy this cert, you've got to manually change this thing out every year. It makes Let's Encrypt just look that much more attractive and it puts a real hurting on DigiCert's business. Now, when you flip the script and say, you know, why would Google want to change the lifespan of these certificates? I don't find such a clear and compelling, you know, commercial motive there. I don't see how Google just magically makes more money because they've shifted business to Let's Encrypt. They don't own Let's Encrypt. If they did, they wouldn't be making any money off of it anyway. And it seems plausible that they, you know, would benefit to continue to benefit as, you know, a big commerce engine on the internet from uh, secure encryption being the norm. Absolutely. That's going to do it for this episode of TechSnap, but you can find more over at techsnap.systems. Head on over to techsnap.systems slash 410 for the show notes for this episode, links to everything we talked about. But you can also find our RSS feed and all the other ways to subscribe or get in touch. 
If you'd like more Jupiter Broadcasting productions, well, just head on over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. We've got a whole range of great shows. And if you haven't already, go check out User Error. If you'd like more Jim, well, you can find him writing over at ours. And of course, he's on Twitter. Jim, you're at? JRSSNet. I'm there too. I'm at Wes Payne. And you can find the whole network at Jupiter Signal. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.